Well, this past week I came across an interesting article uh, called Kindness Changes Everything. The author, Pastor Stephen Whitmer, uh, really gets the person's attention by stating this, uh, this comment. Quote, kindness is underrated. So it got my attention. I, I read through the whole article. It's not that long. And the author here uh, bases his, his assessment uh, on the evidence that comes from the culture where the author observes, quote, people equate kindness with being nice or pleasant. And he goes on to say that uh, this is all about mainly smiling and getting along and not ruffling feathers. So in summary, uh, Pastor Whitmer says that uh, today, uh, kindness is rather a mundane virtue. But he does turn the corner in the article, and he writes, true kindness is Holy Spirit produced. And to support his thesis, he highlights the Apostle Paul in his letters to the Corinthian church. And we know that Paul was dealing with a number of issues in the Corinthian church, and uh, one of them was his apostleship. For some in the church were suggesting that he was not even an apostle at all, not an authentic apostle. And then Paul, of course, makes his case that he was a true apostle as, as any of the other 12 were. And in his second letter, chapter, seven, uh, chapter 6, pardon me, he uh, just lists out his trials and tribulations from the gospel which he, Paul would say, had produced spiritual fruit. And among the spiritual fruit that Paul writes, uh, one such fruit was kindness. So here's the point that Pastor Whitmer is trying to make here. By including kindness as a spiritual fruit, uh, the author argues, in effect, that Paul was saying to the Corinthian church, quote, you want proof I'm an apostle? Okay, here it is. I'm kind, end quote. Well, indeed, Christian kindness is not natural. It is indeed a supernatural fruit of the Spirit. And Pastor uh, Stephen does point us to Romans chapter 2. We learn from there that God is the one who demonstrates the kindness and patience in dealing with people and their sin. For people always seem to underestimate uh, the seriousness of sin. But as Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 2, God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. What truth? God's truth. God's very own truth. And Paul was warning those who pass judgment on others while doing the same things themselves that God will notice. We read in chapter uh, 2 again, verse 4, Or do you show contempt for the riches, riches of his kindness? tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. Well, I don't think there's no better place in the Bible to actually understand the kindness of God in action than in the life of Jesus Christ. As you read through the Gospels, there's the story of the Sermon on the Mount. We see that in Matthew and a piece of it's in Luke. After Jesus had finished the Sermon on the Mount, he, he was coming down the mountainside, and of course, large crowds were following him. And we pick up in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, where a man had come to Jesus with leprosy as he was coming down the mountainside and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured from the leprosy. So here was this lep leper, excluded from uh, the culture around him. He was feared and he was denied access to any social interactions, separated from his family and friends and everything, alone and without any support. And what people feared and avoided, uh, the kindness of God touched and healed. Now this morning we're returning to the Colossian letter as we've been tracking with that with a number of weeks. And you might think that the message uh, would be about kindness. Well, in some sense you'll be right, but it's a lot, a lot more to there that meets the eye. So I want us to turn to our Bible, in our Bibles, to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through to 17. So starting in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, 
Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against some one. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this time now to turn to your word, the Bible, and uh, to uh, worship you in this way by the preaching of your word and the teaching of your word. I pray for all of us here this morning, Lord, that you would, uh, uh, by your Holy Spirit, not only teach us and uh, uh, speak to our hearts in those areas that we need to be touched by your Holy Spirit, but also to motivate us to love and uh, be kind to those around us in this season of time that we live in, but also to do so uh, with, uh, with the desire in our hearts to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the NIV translation begins verse 12 with the conjunction, therefore. So keeping in mind the context of Colossians, and I'm not going to go over that again today, We've been at this for a number of weeks now. I think you should know most of that. We can say that in view of all that God, that God had done for the believer in Colossae, the believers in Colossae through the all-sufficient uh, Savior Jesus Christ, what follows the therefore is the response that God expected from the Colossian believers. And by the way, what God expects from us as well. We go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 11. And there we, we remember that Paul was writing concerning these pagan vices that once were the norm for the believers in the Colossian church. Now from verse 12 through to 17, uh, Paul moves from these negative, uh, the, the negative vices to the positive Christian qualities. You know, as we continue, we, we have to keep in mind that whenever we have a visible virtue, uh, uh, manifest in a Christian person's life, it really, what it does is demonstrate that it has its origin in the heart. This is definitely a spiritual matter, always is a spiritual matter, front to back, top to bottom. And Paul reminds us in the letter that God, ha the Father has, what? Rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Colossians 1.13. Now how has he done this? Well, by the death and resurrection of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. This is the spiritual reality that we are dealing with in this context and in our lives and in the church of Colossae at the time. What does God expect from his people because of this great salvation, this great kindness and grace? Well, as we work through the text, at the very least, we find four expectations from God, from his people. One, be holy. Two, be loving. Three, be at peace, and four, be at worship. So continuing with verse 12, Paul says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. I just want to stop here and make a few points uh, at this moment. Please notice the phrase, as God's chosen people. While we can't really be complete here or, or comprehensive, Paul here connects the Gentiles at the Colossian church and the Jewish Christians with Israel and its Messiah. For Israel and the Gentiles have been chosen by God for salvation. And Paul has already made his case that the, the Jewish and Gentile Christians at, at Colossae, according to Colossians 3.9, had taken off their old self with its practices and had put on their new self. They had been made into a new creation. Now, last week we talked about it in the terms of new humanity, which this is another way of saying it. And because the Holy Spirit abides with the new creation, the new humanity, they have the spiritual power to be a witness to the Lord with their very lives. Now, there's more that could be said, obviously, with this text, especially about God's elective purpose in choosing people for salvation. 
It's also clear in this text that believers are the recipients, if you will, on the receiving end of God's love in a very special way. But that's a message for another time. Our concern here is with the holiness of a believer. We turn now to the Apostle Peter's first letter, chapter 1, verse 15 to 16, where we read, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. There, Peter quoting from Leviticus. So, holiness leads the pack, if you will, here. Because everything that follows from a holy life is the fruit of that holy life. The fruit of a pure life. Not a perfect life this side of heaven. That's why we need to keep short accounts with God and confess our sins to one another, etc. But the fruit of a holy life is what we're talking about here. The Christian qualities that Paul includes in this text, in this section of his letter, demonstrates the result of God's grace in our lives and the holiness that it produces in each believer and in the community, in the church. You see, as a believer seeks to be holy because God is holy, and that's the command, the power of the Holy Spirit will shape and mold the believer, mold their character and the attitude of the believer. And this will be made manifest, if you will, will reveal itself in our lifestyles, and our choices. And folks, holiness is not something that we can hide from those around us. Of course, holiness is from God, and it is sought in our personal devotional time, in our spiritual disciplines, in our Bible reading and studying. It is from the inside out, spiritually speaking, yet it will make its way out into the public. It needs to make its way out into the public. People will see your holiness because you will not be able to keep it secret as you love one another and love others. Holiness will show up when we clothe ourselves, according to this text. There's that word to put on, to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Of course, we're, we're talking here of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives as well here, aren't we? But let me just take a step, a pause. Let me just change gears a little bit here, go down a gear to get a little personal with you and ask you this question. How are you with forgiving others? Let that bounce around in in the brain bucket here for a minute. How are you at forgiving others? How do we as a community of believers, of Christ followers, respond and deal with difficult relationships? How do you deal with people who rub you wrong or have rubbed you wrong? There's a fellow by the name of Kerry Newhoff. He writes an article regarding how people deal with conflict in the church. And he describes how Christians deal with that in this article. Uh, They're not very attractive uh, decisions, I think, in my opinion. For example, he said some people will sidestep the conflict. They'll just go around it and just ignore it. Some people will gossip. They will talk about the other people rather than talk to the people, rather than to deal with the issue, the problem. Others at one end of the spectrum, they just simply avoid conflict altogether. Maybe they just move away from that church, go to another one. Others on the other end of that spectrum, charge full speed ahead right into it, claiming, of course, the high moral ground. Well, the end result often is unforgiveness. And I think we all know how damaging unforgiveness can be uh, to us, uh, our persons, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We all know how damaging unforgiveness that is kept in our heart can be with our human relationships and, and our relationship with God for sure. You see, folks, you and I have been made uh, holy by God's grace in Christ. So what does God expect from his people? Verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone. And how do we forgive? Back to verse 13. We forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
See, our holy response should be to those who hurt us, with those who rub us wrong, anything at all is forgiveness. We need to keep in mind, folks, our own rebellion against the holy, just, and loving God. Our sin against that same holy, just, and loving God. We deserve judgment and punishment, but instead, instead have received God's kindness and grace and love. I would ask you to read the Gospels over and over and over. If you, read, if you don't read the Bible at all, I don't understand how you can even understand this, but if you read the Gospels over and over, you will not find God sidestepping sin. You'll not find God gossiping about other people. You'll, find not, you'll not find God avoiding to get along with people, to go along with hard to get along people. God came not as a judge that first time, but he came as a suffering servant. He entered the mire and muck of sin. He went right into the deep end, folks. And what should our response be to unforgiveness in our hearts? <laughs> Verse 13, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And more than that, we, we read here, we bear with each other. We endure. We endure with those who rub us wrong. We, we stay the course. We work through it. We, we get engaged. As hard as it might be, as hard as it might hurt us sometimes, we need to be engaged until God releases us from that. Well, we have be holy, now we have be loving. In Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul there pointed out the sin of telling lies to each other. Now here in verse 14, Paul stresses love. And we know that love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, is essential in a Christian life. You know, we can do many things for God. We can do many things uh, for the gospel with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors, and around the world. But if we don't have love, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we are nothing. We gain nothing. We are simply a clanging symbol. See, folks, love is greater. Love is even greater than hope and faith. Well, folks, in a nutshell, in this context, love is the opposite of lying. So be loving. Also remember the basic spiritual principle. The basic principle is a spiritual matter. So how do we apply this to love? Well, folks, when God pours out his supernatural love into our hearts, because that's the love that we have for others, the result, according to verse 14, is perfect unity. Love is what binds together all Christian virtues, all the character of a person, all the attitudes of a person, all and the body of Christ itself. Binds them all together in perfect unity. And perfect unity is what? The result of God's grace which unites the church according to chapter 3, verse 3 here, with Christ in God. So be holy, be loving. Next, be at peace. More to the point, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Again, we encounter the spiritual rule of thumb, if you will. The peace of Christ is located in our hearts. That's the place where our desires, our, our motivations, our decisions are located, where they stream from, where they move from. And if the peace of Christ does indeed rule our hearts, then our decisions will include this virtue of peace. And Paul, in this text, completes his point in verse 15 by including the community of believers who are called to be at peace with one another and those around us. Well, Paul points, uh, Paul really sums it up nicely here. Peace comes from Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection. And the false teachers that, that Paul was dealing with in the church at, Col at Colossae were teaching the requirement of some sort of ascetic practices. And the only thing that produced was moral and spiritual disharmony, moral and spiritual disunity in the person and in the church itself. Because according to Colossians 2.22, these things were based on human commands and teachings. They had no value in them, no spiritual value. 
But friends, Christ brings true peace to the believer and the church. Be holy, be loving, be at peace, and finally, but not the least, be at worship. Well, folks, the characteristic of the body of Christ should be one of holiness, love, peace, and of worship. That should be the very characteristic of the body of Christ. And the worship of, 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 of the worship of the church, if you will, is expressed according to one commentator in two ways by quote, instruction and celebration. You know, when we read Paul's letters, you will find that one of his goals was to have the churches imitate Paul's gospel and bring that gospel to those who had not yet heard. And Paul was focused on grounding those churches which he planted and those that he wrote to with the message of Christ. That we, this is the text that we have before us, the message of Christ, or as the ESV has translated, the word of Christ. And Paul was unyielding here, listen to this, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. So what does this mean practically? What does it mean practically? Well, the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible is to be preached uh, and taught. The Bible is to be preached and taught. The Bible is what guides and controls our thoughts, our actions, our lives. The Bible affects every area of our lives, every decision that we make. And because the Holy Spirit is involved in the preaching and teaching of God's Word, the Word of the church is in effect worshiping God. Paul reminds us in chapter 1, verse 5, that we have the word of truth. This is the word of truth. And what is that word? It's the gospel that has come to you, Colossians 1, 6. The word dwell in verse 16 means to live and to be at home. Friends, the Bible is to be at home, to live in you and me. We live in a Christian culture here in the West that is biblically illiterate. It's all about the experience, it seems, these days, not about the teaching and the preaching, unless the teaching and the preaching is easy and doesn't ruffle any feathers. But the Bible is to be at home, to live in you and me. And at the same time, we also know that the Holy Spirit dwells in the believer. So here's the spiritual reality here. Here's the reality the Holy Spirit fills a life that is guided by the Word of God, by the Bible. The Holy Spirit fills a life that is guided by the Bible. And then we have the second manifestation of our salvation here in this text, where Paul writes about psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. That's verse 16. Please notice this worship begins in the hearts of God's chosen people. Here's another issue that we encounter in our context today. When we consider music and singing in the church, we may have our preferences. We may have those styles that we like, the music and the songs that we like, but that should never be the driving force of our worship in the church and the worship of God in the church. You know, folks, when we look at the worship in the Bible, the music, the instruments, the song, the singing was all meant to complement the teaching in the worship service. Because worship really is the normal response of the community of believers where God has poured out his grace and love. That's what worship is. And true biblical worship is not about being entertained by the worship team or musicians. It's not about the musician, period. True biblical worship is not about feeling good, getting goosebumps, or having some emotional high, even though those can occur in a worship of God. But true biblical worship is the response to the truths of God as taught in the Word of God. True biblical worship is the response to God's amazing grace and salvation through the death and resurrection of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ.
So folks, be holy, be loving, be at peace, be at worship. And finally, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, which is truth. We thank you that it stands the test of time, that every single dot and tittle, everything will not uh, disappear until everything has been accomplished. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your presence here by your spirit. And as we go from this building, as we go from this uh, church building, we ask, Lord, that you would go ahead of us and prepare the way for us so that we can be ready to share the good news of Christ. That we could be, uh, be at peace, that we could be loving, that we could be holy, that we could be at worship, even as we go from this place. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.